a free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. This is essentially the rate at which free fall would happen. It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down. In the debate over the destruction of the World Trade Center, two important organizations have played a major role. One is NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which was officially tasked by the U.S. government to investigate the collapse of the three skyscrapers. In 2005, NIST presented their final report on the collapse of the Twin Towers, and in 2008, the one on Building 7. For the Twin Towers, NIST concluded that they were brought down by the consequences of the impacts and the ensuing fires, while Building 7, according to NIST, was brought down primarily by fire alone. In other words, they fully confirmed the official version by the U.S. government. The other organization to bear weight on the debate has been Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, an association of professionals in civil construction founded in 2006 by San Francisco architect Richard Gage. Architects and Engineers lists over 2,000 experts in structural engineering, science of materials, architectural design, fire protection, science of construction, metallurgy, and even experts in controlled demolitions. Since they've entered the fray, Architects and Engineers has brought to the table a solid amount of scientific information refuting the official explanation by NIST on the collapses and confirming the theory of controlled demolitions instead. At the same time, Architects and Engineers has acted as an unrelenting watchdog for every action taken by NIST, pointing out every single error in their work and even forcing them, in some cases, to make corrections to their reports. I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and correct in the final version of the report. Okay. The first issue that needs to be clarified is the actual strength and solidity of the Twin Towers, since both the 9-11 Commission and the debunkers have made extensive efforts to depict them as extremely light and fragile buildings. The outside of each tower was covered by a frame of 14-inch wide steel columns. The centers of the steel columns were 40 inches apart. These exterior walls bore the majority of the weight of the building. The interior core of the buildings was a hollow steel shaft in which elevators and stairwells were grouped. Le torri di New York invece erano sostenute da un'intelaiatura esterna, da sottili nervature d'acciaio, insomma erano come dei parallelepipedi vuoti. Il World Trade Center era una struttura leggerissima, era la massima espressione del grattacielo leggero, come, come lo chiamano i tecnici. C'è un solo altro edificio che io sappia, che è la, quella che si chiamava un tempo la Sears Tower a Chicago, che usa lo stesso tipo di struttura. As we shall see, all these statements are false. Contrary to traditional skyscrapers, where all the support columns are equally spaced, in the Twin Towers, part of the supporting columns had been moved towards the exterior wall, creating a large column-free space available for rental. For this reason, the external structure had literally become a grid of steel columns made with prefabricated blocks that were mounted on site. These are the thin steel nerves mentioned by debunker Alberto Angela, 244 steel columns placed approximately two feet apart, which supported 40% of the weight of the towers. Far from being two empty parallelepipeds, the internal structure was comprised of 47 steel columns, so long and sturdy that a special factory in Japan had to be built in order to assemble them. It was the core structure to support the majority of the weight of the building, 60% of it, and not the external structure. The core structure seen on the left is what the 9-11 Commission has called a hollow steel shaft. This is the same core structure near the base of the tower. The core structure was an actual, extremely robust steel skyscraper built within another skyscraper. The core structure housed the stairs, the elevators, and all other services needed for the functioning of the tower. The inner walls of the core structure were made of simple layers of sheetrock. A long series of steel trusses connected the core structure to the external one and supported the floors. The floors were also prefabricated rectangular pieces covered by a thin layer of concrete. The internal and external structure connected through an umbrella-like structure called a hat truss, which kept together the towers and bound them from above. The idea that this kind of structure is fragile and therefore no longer used after 9-11 is disproven by the new Building 7 built by Larry Silverstein. A strong central structure supports the majority of the weight of the building. 
Long steel beams support the floors and connect the core structure to the external one, allowing for large, column-free space in between, a very similar concept to the one used in the Twin Towers. Most importantly, the debunkers forget to mention that the Twin Towers were built with a structural redundancy of three to five times the weight they were meant to support. This structure was capable of holding three to five times the weight. These buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. So those perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them, and the core columns could handle three times the load above them. In addressing the solidity of the Twin Towers, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology stated that its 244 perimeter columns made it one of the most redundant and one of the most resilient skyscrapers. On the same subject, the architectural firm of Roth & Sons wrote, the building as designed is 16 times stiffer than a conventional structure. The Virenveal trusses would be so effective, according to the engineer's calculations, that all the columns on one side of a tower could be cut, as well as the two corners and several columns on the adjacent sides, and the tower would still be strong enough to withstand a 100 mile per hour wind. John Skilling, the structural engineer who designed the Twin Towers, stated, Live loads on these perimeter columns can be increased more than 2,000% before failure occurs. In particular, the Twin Towers were designed to sustain the impact of a large airliner traveling at 600 miles per hour and still remain standing. Interviewed in 1993 by the Seattle Times, John Skilling stated, we looked at every possible thing we could think of that could happen to the buildings, even to the extent of an airplane hitting the side. Our analysis indicated the biggest problem would be the fact that all the fuel from the airplane would dump into the building. There would be a horrendous fire. A lot of people would be killed. The building structure would still be there. And it was. After the impacts, both towers remained standing, showing no major effect on their stability. Furthermore, NIST has confirmed that the initial jet fuel fires themselves lasted at most a few minutes. This means that from that moment on, the only available source of fuel for the fires was common office furnishings. And, as we know, regular office fires are not hot enough to affect the stability of a steel structure. No steel frame high-rise building has ever collapsed due to fire. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. These kinds of designs have performed extraordinarily well over uh, history. In fact, until this occurrence, no building had fallen down because of fire. Furthermore, NIST estimated the combustible fuel loading was somewhat lower than found in prior surveys of office spaces. The number of interior walls, and thus the minimal amount of combustible interior finish and limited bookshelf space account for much of the differences. There was no reason for the towers to collapse at that point. With a structure that had clearly withstood the impacts and with less than average office content to feed the fires, both buildings should have remained standing. A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. This is essentially the rate at which free fall would happen. From what I, what I understand, the buildings actually accelerated as they came down, meaning they were not getting resistance from these massive columns in the center of the core of this building. The core of this building was very heavy. They're huge columns, huge. This block accelerates straight down, uh, or is it picking up speed downward continually. It doesn't slow down, it just continues to gain speed. It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down. The Twin Towers could, could not have come straight down through the thousands of tons of structural steel through the greatest resistance. They're columns of steel around the exterior of the building and within the core, all of which are there to prevent uh, the, the thing from falling down. And so if, even if something falls on it, it's not gonna immediately just go pop, 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 like that, floor by floor. It's gonna, if it's gonna collapse, it's gonna have to take some time to weaken the structure below it. This structure was capable of holding three to five times the weight and here it is falling through it with the resistance of only one third of its weight. Roughly 90% of the resistance has been removed and what's happening is the top section is not crushing down 
the lower section like a pile driver, which is the picture that Nis basically is painting. It's, it's actually falling into material that's already been pulverized, that's offering very little resistance. It's just coming down through pre-pulverized material. The buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. Structural connections not only had to fail nearly simultaneously, but in sequential order. I would not have expected the whole building to just give in at once. And I thought it rather odd that they um, fell almost perfectly uh, in, in very similar ways. Um, it seemed odd that lightning would strike twice. And it certainly would stay in the damage zone. It would not drop down through 80,000 ton of insulated, undamaged structural steel and do it in 12 seconds. This claimed that the upper section of each of the towers crushed the lower section. However, when you watch video closely, in the case of World Trade Center 1, you'll see that the upper section disintegrates itself. It appears to be a controlled demolition of its own, of the upper section. The top section, pushing on the bottom section, it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. In fact, it could be suggested that NIST never explained the collapses by gravity alone because it would be impossible to do so without violating at least two of the most fundamental laws of physics. One is Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that two opposing forces will neutralize each other. In a head-on collision, the two cars absorb each other's kinetic energy and transform it into physical deformation or damage. After that, the system comes to a rest, as there is no more energy to be dissipated. The top section, pushing on the bottom section, it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. Something of this kind is what we should have seen when the top section of the towers collapsed onto the lower one. The upper and lower sections should have mutually destroyed each other until all the energy is dissipated and the system comes to a rest. Alternatively, as shown in this experiment with two towers made of snow, the top section could have fallen off to the side after the initial collapse. What could not have happened is this. A little tiny chunk of the building can't possibly fall and crush the entire structure below it. This is such a simple, fundamental concept that architects and engineers were astonished in seeing it totally ignored by NIST. This is high school physics and our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. But even if we assume that the top section of the tower had enough potential energy to destroy the rest of the structure below, it could not have done so at the speed it did, which was near freefall speed. That would have violated an even more important principle in physics, known as the law of momentum conservation. This law states that the total energy within an isolated system must always remain the same. As we have seen, the energy can be transformed within the system from motion to physical deformation. But for the deformation to begin, the velocity must decrease in order for one kind of energy to be transformed into the other. No new energy can be added to the system. One particular example of momentum conservation is freefall. Freefall happens when the only force applied on an object is gravity. This means that all the potential energy contained by the object is converted into vertical motion. As soon as the falling object hits an obstacle and breakage occurs, the speed must decrease because some of its energy needs now to be converted into physical breakage. It takes energy to break things apart, and that energy must come from within the system. Thus, the falling rock cannot keep falling at free fall speed and break apart at the same time because it doesn't have enough energy to do both. Let's go now to the Twin Towers and ask a simple question. 
assuming that the top section on the left contains enough potential energy to destroy the rest of the tower, and assuming we dropped both upper sections at the same time, which one would hit the ground first? It would be the second, of course. As it finds no obstacles in its path, the section on the right would quickly accelerate to free fall speed and maintain it all the way to the ground. The section on the left, instead, needs to use some of its energy to destroy the structure below, so it could never achieve free fall speed. In the case of the Twin Towers, however, both upper sections fell with an acceleration close to free fall speed, as if their path had been practically free from obstacles. It took each tower between 10 and 12 seconds to collapse to the ground, while an absolute free fall time would have been 9.2 seconds. In other words, both upper sections of the towers found enough energy to destroy 80,000 tons of healthy structure below while accelerating to near free fall speed. This is, as we have said, absolutely impossible by gravity alone. The law of momentum conservation won't allow it. A building cannot do free fall with a huge structural steel structural system in place to support it. If in fact it actually hit and made an impact I was effectively crushing anything, pushing hard on this core structure below it. The core structure is going to push back equally hard, and that's what's going to cause the top section of the building to slow down. There is only one way for those buildings to have collapsed at the speed they did. The buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. The same Shyam Sunder from NIST has acknowledged that free fall can only be achieved with the absence of a structure below. Free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. But what could have removed the supporting structure below, since the falling section didn't have any extra energy to do so? The fact that it's coming down at free fall says all of the energy is being used to just make it go straight down which means it's coming down through itself and not breaking up the building as it goes. Something else has to be clearing the way. There is only one known way to allow that kind of acceleration while removing the supporting structure. A building cannot do free fall without it being blown up. That's the only way it could come down at free fall. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives, in other words, controlled demolition. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. So thermite, if it was uh, present at the World Trade Center and created this molten metal that uh, so many witnesses and uh, photographic evidence shows, would also explain potentially the fact that the fires could not be put out at ground zero. The fires lasted for quite a while, but um, most importantly, they were um, deep within the pile where people would expect that it, the environment was oxygen starved. And uh, thermite could explain this because it has its own oxidant within. It's actually the uh, metallic oxide that provides the oxidant to allow the uh, incendiary thermite reaction to occur, even underwater. Somebody's lying. I'm going to leave it up to you to make your own conclusions. The last fire was not even extinguished for three months after 9-11. Tom Manley says you couldn't even begin to imagine how much water was pumped in there. It was like you were creating a giant lake. Well, thermite contains its own source of oxygen. It burns just as well under water. <laughs> 